So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Zhong Liu. On behalf of the ESIP Information Quality Cluster, welcome everyone on the last day of uh, the meeting. So today's agenda is uh, first, I'm, I'm going to give an introduction and the overview of the information quality uh, landscape, uh, followed by uh, several talks uh, about uh, information quality from different uh, uh, perspectives. Uh, after that, we will have a discussion. So without further ado, let's get started. <clears throat> so here is the outline of today's talk. So uh, much work has been done uh, about the uh, Earth's information uh, quality. It's uh, quite a challenge to present the landscape in uh, 10 minutes. So the landscape for Earth's information quality is uh, complex and multi-faceted, involving numerous uh, stakeholders, such as uh, data producer, data repositories, data services, and uh, users, as well as the methodologies and the uh, standards. So Earth's information uh, quality landscapes are also dynamic and uh, evolving over time such as uh, new initiatives, AI, ML, cloud computing, interdisciplinary science, diverse uh, user uh, communities. So over the years, uh, the ESIP Information Quality Cluster and other organizations uh, have uh, pursued the ways to understand and improve information quality. So these are uh, some uh, examples for the latest uh, activities, such as uh, new initiatives, uh, NASA's uh, uh, Earth Science to Action, uh, looking for trusted, actionable inform information, yeah. And also NOAA's weather and uh, climate ready nations, all these uh, initiatives uh, will provide a trusted, actionable information to the uh, society. And also uh, science, uh, aspect interdisciplinary science and open science and they also use the needs we need to address uh, diverse uh, users community and uh, also new technologies and the capabilities so there are several key uh, organizations uh, uh, involved in the uh, improving uh, information quality such as NASA, uh, European space agencies, and other organizations. Also, uh, Global Climate Observing System, uh, and also the Earth, our Earth Science Information Partners, ESIP uh, Information Quality Clusters, and uh, yeah, and also the World Meteorological Organization, WMO. So, uh, four aspects of information quality defined by the ESIP information uh, quality cluster. And uh, so the first one is the scientific quality. And, and uh, so it's about the accuracy, uh, precision, uncertainty, uh, and so on. And it's uh, more about the, uh, uh, the, the, the state of the science and also the algorithm, you know, yeah, development. And uh, also the product quality, the degree of a scientific quality assessment and uh, documentation, metadata, there are so many things uh, involved in the uh, product quality as well as the, you know, the, the, the process to generate uh, this uh, uh, product yeah, as well. So the stewardship quality, the quality of the data management and the uh, preservations so this is also very important. On top of that, and also the data service uh, uh, quality too. So we need to provide user-friendly, reliable data services uh, to the user, yeah. So uh, information quality cluster activities in the past uh, several years. So we defined the four aspects of information quality and the data quality, rec we send, we uh, develop a data quality recommendations for the NASA's uh, as this uh, standard coordination office. And uh, you can find these uh, materials uh, on their website. And uh, we ho uh, have a monthly uh, telecoms 
and the ECB uh, July and the January meetings. We had a joint uh, sessions with the open science and the AI data readiness uh, clusters. And uh, we also participated in uh, uh, working group, other working groups like uh, uh, NASA's uh, ESDS uh, WG uh, uh, working group uh, about the uh, uh, data producer development guide and also the inter interoperable interoperability yeah, and uh, also the interdisciplinary and their user needs, yeah. And uh, we also publish uh, articles in different uh, uh, journals. So challenges and uh, future uh, directions. So challenges and the future directions uh, depend on uh, many factors. So first one is the data value and the var varieties. So created some uh, you know challenges because uh, data data products are very diverse, you know, with the different, uh, you know, ways uh, to create a data products. You know, so the standard, I, so the standards are very important here. That's also related to the interoperability. So, and also we know observations play a key role in improving uh, data quality. So we need a uh, next generation platforms and the infrastructures to support uh, data sharing. Yeah, I, I don't think NASA or NOAA alone can solve this problem. So we need uh, the whole community, you know, uh, get involved. Also, we need to have a uh, stakeholder engagement. We need to uh, create a uh, develop, uh, you know, data products to meet their needs. And the uh, global collaboration is uh, a must. So now we have uh, questions for all, you know, uh, during the discussion, maybe right now you can think about it or during the other, uh, you know, uh, du during the talks after this, yeah. So the first one is uh, what are the priorities for improving information quality for the short term and the long term? Yeah, we have developed so many uh, standards and uh, recommendations. So how can we, uh, you know, uh, implement them, you know, in a long term or short term, you know, yeah. So, and the how uh, smoothly and efficiently implement, uh, you know, these uh, recommendations and the best practice. So without interrupting existing uh, operations, yeah. So operational people always are worried about, you know, the interruptions, yeah. So how can we make sure uh, information quality is available uh, in the next generation data and the computing infrastructures. Yeah, especially, you know, more and more data uh, products are created on the fly, you know, yeah. And how to encourage it and expand a broader participation to improve uh, information quality. That's the last question. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. So our uh, first uh, speaker is So our first speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Robert Downs from Columbia University and NASA CDEC. So this is also a uh, co-chair of the ECB Information uh, Quality Partner. Okay. Thank you very much, John. Okay. <laughs> Which one do I speak in? Well, you can do everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. So, uh, thank you. So this is a PC? Yes. Oh, great. So you, should, you can uh, hit that one. Yep. Yeah. 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 Oh, that one. Yep, okay. This one? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about information quality and the data review process here. And uh, John had talked a little bit about the uh, uh, different life cycle stages and uh, that came out of the Ramaprian et al. Uh, paper. And then building on that, um, uh, uh, myself, uh, Rama, Peng, and Yak Xing, uh, we came up with uh, applying that towards uh, infra, uh, citizen science. 
And uh, so uh, we depicted it in, in this way that you see here on your screen. And so building further, oops, that's the wrong one. Uh, building further on that, I'm starting to look at what stakeholder roles, and, and actually we were having a discussion about this, which uh, inspired me to think about it this way. There was a little bit of a negotiation about you know uh, who should be doing what when, and um, and so uh, people were saying, well, you know, uh, data producers or early science quality and product quality uh, seem to be uh, uh, primary areas there for data producers. But I would also argue that you know when you're developing services. Uh, for data, sometimes the data producers are involved at least at the beginning of that. And um, uh, data producer or data repositories, uh, you know, even though they're not necessarily involved in the uh, data collection themselves, uh, when it comes to the science quality, uh, they are trying to manage that whole process with with various stakeholders and including the data producers. And so we uh, tend to see them throughout the whole process. Uh, certainly they want to make sure that the, the product uh, is reusable and any services that come out of that data product are also usable and then uh, to facilitate ongoing, access and use into the future. They certainly want to make sure that the uh, stewardship quality of the data are there. And so um, likewise, the data users uh, end up being involved in, in various roles. Uh, the data producers in themselves are data users uh, uh, and that they might be the first users of the data. Uh, but uh, as we start to look at the uh, science quality of the data and even get those data disseminated uh, to the users, we certainly want to get feedback from them. Uh, there's uh, uh, better avenues than others for doing that. And I think we need to really improve in that regard uh, to get more input uh, from uh data users, and uh, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that as we move on. And then the sponsors are certainly uh, there from the beginning, and uh, it might actually be different sponsors. That is, we might have one sponsor who's uh, supporting the data producers, and then other uh, sponsors who are trying to support uh, the development of uh, products and services based on those data, and then even possibly other sponsors looking at uh, ensuring that those uh, data are going to be uh, uh, continually usable over time. But uh, we shouldn't should not be uh, forgetting about others, and I, I think there are others besides those that I've mentioned here, but. Uh, uh, journal editors, uh, they're certainly involved uh, and have been involved for, for a long time uh, looking at the science quality, uh, but that's particularly through the lens of uh, the article or the manuscript that's been submitted for publication. Uh, we hope that there's some data review in that regard and uh, I think some journals are starting to work with data repositories uh, in that regard as well, because I think um, it's a recognized uh, gap, for lack of a better term. Uh, uh, during the manuscript review process, the data aren't necessarily getting a rigorous review. Uh, uh, um, and um, we also want to mention the software developers and they might actually have a larger role than what we're seeing here because uh, uh, they might be more involved in, in early up front. Uh, but uh, I think that also tends to be the scientists who are uh, the, doing the data collection might be 
engaging in some software development themselves, regardless of whether they consider themselves software developers or not. So I think we need more work in that area as well. Uh, another way of looking at uh, the uh, data review process is in terms of how we might uh, improve the efficiency of the efforts. Uh, it can be real challenging to get a uh, comprehensive data review, and uh, especially if it's being done uh, by humans. So if we can have automated data reviews being done, uh, as well as the manual data reviews, that, that certainly would help. And so uh, here we have four quadrants where we're, we're looking at uh, 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 either the extent of automated versus manual and uh, the internal versus the external data review. Uh, and often uh, we call it, uh, if it's the external is done manually, a, a, a data a peer review. And so building on that a little bit, um, we can look at the automated and the semi-automated uh, uh, approaches. And there we would wanna have uh, the relevant uh, resources included uh, and uh, things such as an inventory of files and uh, uh, the links that are working, of course, to related resources. And then uh, things like the uh, file integrity, the checksums, et cetera, and formats, they can be done automatically. And some of the metadata and documentation should be able to be parsed to uh, determine whether uh, their values or value types are, are, are there in the required fields. Uh, and um, even uh, if there's software code, whether that's documented, uh, that should be easily determined if the uh, language is determined. And then um, the variables, uh, whether uh, the uh, uh, values are in the expected ranges, for example, uh, they're appropriate uh, variable value types, and uh, uh, we would wanna have them defined uh, and uh, that might be more semi-automated as compared to automated, uh, since we would hope that such definitions are understandable by humans. And then uh, the uh, uh, ethical aspects could also be uh, automated or semi-automated to some extent where we ensure that there are licenses. Uh, and um, if there are any kinds of uh, restrictions or sensitive information there, uh, we want to make sure that uh, there is information about that. And again, that might move more into the semi-automated as compared to being uh, purely automated. And if, of course, there are any regulations involved, we want to make sure that they're met as well. And then uh, we could also have some uh, uh, community ad advice uh, uh, to facilitate that. Um, uh, you know, talking to the data producers um, and uh, getting them to prepare their data in such a way that uh, uh, they are uh, in a state that can be e efficiently uh, reviewed. And I, I think this is going to take a little bit of a, a workload balance because um, uh, the submitters can't be expected to do it at all. Uh, often they don't uh, have that information. And uh, uh, the reviewers, uh, their time, volunteer reviewers, uh, their time is very precious. And I think we have to make sure that the load is light uh, for for human reviewers uh, to, to that um, and uh, providing any uh, alternative information that we can for for um, the uh, uh, data submitters as well as instruction and training and if we can offer them any kinds of uh, templates and forms to uh, to uh, 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 at least semi-automate that process, that would certainly help. 
and uh, informing them about uh, the standards that might be available, either international or community standards, as, as well as um, any coding and scripts that might be able to help facilitate this automation process. And then looking at uh, information quality control during the curatorial uh, review, um, we want to make sure that the data landing page does have the uh, uh, information that's needed on there about the data set as well as uh, having a, a recommended data citation. And um, we want to also make sure that our metadata and the documentation is going to facilitate understandability by those who we expect to be using the resources as, as well as um, uh, having uh, uh, information that's uh, clear about, for instance, rights and any uh, presence of sensitive information, and uh, having the attribution information and there are any stakeholders who've contributed uh, certainly should be included in, in at least the documentation. And then also uh, making sure that the data files are uh, accessible and error-free, of course. And then uh, during uh, the uh, external peer review process, you know, we want to uh, be able to ensure that the science and the product quality are, are met um, uh, things like the study description, et cetera, uh, uh, should be clear. And uh, I would uh, strongly encourage uh, the data review, uh, uh, peer, external data peer, uh, external peer review efforts include a focus on the methodology uh, and uh, any instruments uh, or measurements that are involved in that. And then we also want to be able to look at uh, applicable usage of the, the data. Uh, and um, I would hope that the uh, external peer reviewers could be able to do, I, I guess we're assuming that they have the expertise to do a comparison with data from similar studies at, at the same time. So in, in terms of uh, looking at the results of the information quality uh, process and data review. Um, the um, uh, issues that remain are questions for data uh, producers and the repository. Uh, we need to resolve uh, the, uh, revi or revise the metadata, the documentation and the data, and ensure that the um, the dissemination of the report about the uh, review is uh, done in a way that works out for the different stakeholders. So for example, we might want to um, decide whether uh, we're going to uh, uh, describe the review results in some way uh, and where that's going to be and uh, what's going to be included in that description. And for example, uh, our, uh, and this is really related to reviewer recognition as well, are we going to acknowledge the reviewers or um, is the review going to be an anonymous? But we certainly should think about how we can acknowledge the reviewers, uh, if not for a particular uh, 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 data product that was reviewed, but for their efforts or volunteership during the um, uh, the uh, 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 review of different data products uh, uh, for either a particular collection or repository, uh, perhaps we can acknowledge them. Uh, you know, it could be an annual report um, that we say we've got these reviewers who've volunteered uh, 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 their time to um, uh, conduct peer review for us. Uh, we also might want to have a letter of acknowledgement for the reviewers. And um, 
uh, such uh, letters might also be copied to their employer so that uh, when it comes time for them uh, to uh, get a promotion, they could use that letter in that way. And I, I think that we really need to work harder on other forms of recognition for peer reviewers. And um, uh, I think that's going to be critical because uh, getting people to review articles, for example, we see can be a real challenge. And uh, if we're going to be looking at the same pool of reviewers and ask them to review data as well, uh, you know, where do people get the time to do this and why would they do it? I, there, there needs to be uh, another little trade-off here. And so some questions for us to think about might be, what characteristics of information quality should reviewers focus on to ensure that the data are fit for reuse? And how can efficiencies be further attained in assessing information quality during the peer review data? Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Hi, George. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Dr. George Hoffman from uh, NASA Garda Space Flight Center, the developer of uh, the very popular global precipitation product, iMERGE. So he will talk about the uh, data quality challenges from uh, our data producers' uh, uh, perspective. George, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, you see me full screen? Yeah. Okay. Full screen. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm glad to be here and have this chance to discuss. And I think I've got a clear screen now. So in addition to myself, uh, Bob Adler, Chris Funk, Eric Elkin, Jackson Tan contributed to this uh, talk. I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about quality and what to do about it to the extent that we know. Um, Okay, so um, I do a multi-satellite precipitation algorithm and I have for a while. And so what we've got is a diverse and changing and uncoordinated, I might say, input data set, set and its periods of record, regions of coverage and strengths and limitations for each of the sensors. So what we wanna get out of this is global precipitation that's long and detailed. But we, of course, we want to minimize things, including the discontinuities um, and hmm, random error, which we think of as a part that eventually averages out. With precipitation, this is an issue because it's intermittent and bias, which is a part that doesn't average out. And so um, that really drives the, the climate people crazy. And in addition, I show here the, the GOIR record, which we use as well as the low orbit passive microwave to do these things. Uh, GPCP is a climate kind of record. iMERGE is a weather kind of record. And the difference is GPCP, we get a, a, a CVR-like um, product, mostly by throwing out a lot of data and, and only keeping things that are consistent. Uh, there are a possibility, there's a possibility of, of bias because of the way we do things, but it's consistent across the entire record. So this is uh, iMERGE, which is the weather kind of record. It's half degree, half hourly uh, from 2000 to the present. Here I'm showing at half degree resolution against GPCP, um, the latest version 3.2, and this is the latest iMERGE, which is version seven over ocean and land separately. Um, the orange colors land, they're nearly identical because over land at the monthly scale, we're incorporating gauges and they tend to dominate in most parts of land. 
the ocean is uh, rather different algorithms and there is not a gauge to sort of keep everything anchored. And so there are differences, but they're actually not that bad. Um, it's sort of interesting with such a different um, algorithms. I will point out that solid black line is when we switched from using the tropical rainfall measuring mission trim as the overall calibrator for iMERGE to uh, the GPM, global precipitation measurement mission uh, data. And what you see is across that boundary, we have pretty well homogenized it, although that's not quite true as you'll see. One interesting thing to point out here, since I'm showing this, is that if you look at the last big La Nina back across 2011, the land and ocean move in opposite directions. The ocean moves down, the land moves up. And in contrast, the El Nino, which is the flip side of the La Nina, one of the big ones recently bridging across 2016, the land uh, goes down, the ocean goes up. If someone shows you ENSO events, only over land using gauges say, they will tell you the wrong thing, which is, oh, the global in precipitation increases or decreases. In fact, when you put these together, they nearly cancel out. It's interesting. We tend to prefer the GPCP for uh, climate analysis because it's more homogeneous, but in fact, you can see that they're, they're sort of similar. I will point out that now this solid black line is the point at which the iMERGE uh, now, the TRIM observatory had an orbit boost. And you will notice that right there, suddenly the, the blue and purple lines cross. Um, that's because there's, um, there are, there's a discontinuity in the calibrator from TRIM. And we only discovered this for real when iMERGE had a similar boost in November of 2023, which raised a question about the continuity of calibration. And so we... Whoops, we uh, went back and looked at the trim. Some other surprises. We, we start finding defects in the old input data. Uh, we, and in particular, we, we need consistent spatial averaging for different sensors that have different resolutions to get a consistent bias. Finally, the histograms are sensitive to the amount of time-space averaging that happens. This is not a surprise when I say it, but until you say it, you don't necessarily think about it. So um, we have moved the goalposts. It used to be that that mean picture, which I just showed, you know, it's like we get our gold star because the means look like each other. But in fact, now uh, climate and weather people want to talk about extremes, which means you the whole histogram has to be right. Um, and so this is a new level of uncertainty which needs to be accounted for in your description of the data set uh, for precipitation at least. What I've done here is uh, is put together a, what I call HATS, the Histogram Anomaly Time Series that uh, I did an article with Jerry Potter back in uh, 2020, formerly of 606. And what you see here is, uh, yeah, so it was in BAMS. So on the vertical axis, I have the precipitation rate, and then I plot each histogram as a vertical column, which is colorized exponentially because there are lots of little events and not a, only a few big events. Unfortunately, when I did this, it's like, well, okay, it's streaky, but what's that mean? So then if you do an average at each precipitation rate, um, seasonally varying average, you know, climatology, and then subtract that from the meet, from the actual plot, you get the plot at the bottom. It's the anomaly from the mean seasonal cycle as a function of rain rate, precipitation rate. And what you see is, oh, okay, now you start seeing things. This is just for a month. Uh, it's July of 2021. 20, uh, but you see there are definitely these, even over the entire ocean, 50 degrees north to south, there are periods when you have lots, you know, there's pluses and minuses. So you start to get insight into what the histogram is doing. The reason I did this is because I was trying to find homogeneous periods of histograms and I was getting frustrated. We had to guess and we go in and look and well, is that really the right period? This tells you. Uh, so you can, you can start to see systematic differences. So here's an example for daily histograms for the new GPCP 
version 3.2 and the old GPCP version 1.3. Some of you perhaps have used one or the other of these. And what you see is very clearly version 1.3, you get to 2009, <laughs> bang, something happened. Well, the calibrator changed. And even though the mean of the calibrator was very carefully tuned, the histograms were different. Now in version 3.2, the differences are smaller. You still see a difference here in 2014, which is when the calibrator, the, this is uh, the daily 3.2 is based on iMERGE scale to the monthly GPCP. And so this is this change in histograms reflects the change in histograms in iMERGE, change of calibrator from trim before that point to GPM after that point. It's not as bad, but it's not zero. We still have work to do. Okay, so getting more into the uncertainty part of things, uh, users were banging on us that they needed some kind of a simple quality index. Simple advice, good, fair, questionable. So what we need to do is have a quantitative thing that we can simplify to that simple advice, the, the quality index, but it's traceable back to something quantitative. It's not just, I guess so, or I guess not more often. Um, so at the top of the page is the monthly quality index for both GPCP and iMERGE is done the same way. It's based on the ran estimated random error of the monthly and uh, the thresholds we suggest are greater than four, two to four, and less than two for good, fair, and questionable. This doesn't address the bias um, because that's a harder quantity to estimate. This is, the units are sort of weird, it's gauges per two and a half degree box. So even over the ocean, you can invert the error and say, if it were gauges, because of the simple formulation we use, if it were gauges over the ocean with that error, how many gauges does that imply? Uh, and what you see is that you have, uh, in a lot of places where there's reasonable amount of precipitation, you have on the order of four or five gauges per two and a half degree box, which is actually considered not bad. Obviously over land where you have lots of gauges like the US, Europe, uh, China, parts of, of Australia, you know, we're, we're good to go. But even over ocean, it's not so bad. But in the low rain areas, say the subtropical high off of South America, it's a little bit questionable. At the half hourly level for iMERGE, we really, this is an experiment. Um, we have a, a, a Kalman filter that combines various parts of the input to give us an overall uh, number. And so out of that Kalman filter, we can come up with a estimate of the correlation of that half hourly value in that grid box against either TMI or GMI, depending on which era it's in. This runs from zero to one. Um, so one means that it's absolutely correlated with TMI or GMI in that time period. And what you see is that there are some places where you get pretty close to one, but then as you get away from overpasses by satellites, the, the morphing that we do doesn't, doesn't change the overpasses. It just moves them around forward and backward and then does averaging with IR if you're, if you're stuck. And so what you see is that, you know, like there's a there's some sections here that haven't had an overpass in a while and con consequently don't have very good quality. Our suggested thresholds are greater than 0.75, somewhere between 0.5 and 0.75 and less than um, 0.5. And so by the time you get down here, you know, in the, in the polar regions, which have a particularly low, quality on account of uh, uncertainties in the retrievals. Yeah, it says, okay, use them if you want to, but just be really careful. So comments and alternatives to these are, are welcome. Uh, we, we really struggled and, and to be honest, I don't know, we haven't yet had a user that looked at the quality index and said, wow, that's exactly what I need. The monthly is, is more certain and, and I have actually had a few people use that. Okay, I think this is my last slide. Comments on the future of uncertainty. I actually put this when uh, I signed in, I was we were invited to have questions or prompts. 
different users want different statements about uncertainty. And after 30 years of trying, it's it's still not nailed down what different users actually need. Um, we're getting closer, and so I'm going to describe that. But I think there's still work to be done of helping users with this uncertainty problem, at least in the case of, of precipitation. I mean, we're sort of weird because precipitation is intermittent and highly skewed. And so the uncertainty is not is a long way from stats 101 uh, standard deviation. Okay, so we, we, on the producer side, continue to strive for grid box level error estimates that don't require local ground truth data because over, pick a number, 85% of the globe, we don't have that local ground truth data. Uh, estimating random bias, random error at the fine time scales is really challenging. Bias at any time scale is challenging because we don't have the ground truth data. And so we've got to parameterize it based on ground validation studies in a few places. So I, I suggest we haven't really done this yet, but if we considered the individual grid box in the context of neighboring grid boxes and then use ancillary information like weather regime, surface type, if we give users probabilities, a probability spread, not just a random error, that gives the, them a better extreme information. Uh, but how do we do this without breaking the bank? If I hand the user quantile, 10 quantile values, their head's going to explode and they won't use it. Um, so there's a question, is it parametric, which sort of forces things to look the same? I've, I've got... You know, some colleagues who have a three parameter fitted distribution, but the fitted distribution sort of bends, but it's still always sort of that fitted distribution. Quantiles, like I said, the, the number of number of quantiles you report can quickly overwhelm the user. Um, <laughs> retrievals and combinations. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, we we're we have a ways to go. And so I I hear users and funders loud and clear that they want uncertainty, but we're, it's, a, it's a grand challenge in precipitation field. The other thing is I've sort of in, implied this, that the range of user needs and expertise means that we probably need multiple statements about uncertainty. For example, perhaps we have the, the parametric representation, which the, you know, the uh, modelers and the uh, stream flow people will know what to do with because they're power users. But then, you know, you have folks that are tracking zebras in, in Africa who wouldn't know what to do with that. So we've got to, we have, we have to accommodate them as well. One thing that I'm hoping is that the probabilistic statement will naturally carry both the bias and the random error. I'm a little bit squishy on that, but I, I'm sort of hoping that comes true. And finally, one of the other grand challenges, how these uncertainties aggregate to the coarser scales. Um, they're, they are correlated. And so you can't simply treat each half hour grid box as an, ind an independent estimate. They're correlated and you have to take that into account. Okay, so with that, I'm done. And I thank you for your attention. Now I've got to get out of here. Sorry, I'm trying to unshare, but the interface is doing me dirty. If you can unshare me, that would be great. Yep. Ah, there we go. It's over here. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, George. Thank you, George. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Douglas Rao from uh, uh, NOAA, and he will talk about the uh, data quality challenges in AI ML applications.
Thanks, John. I realized I forgot to change the title of the slides, but the title should be data quality for uh, AI applications. But um, I'm going to go through some of the work we have been doing through the um, ESIP cluster and also some of the background information about how the AI and machine learning community has been talking about the data quality and how its implication um, on the uh, downstream applications of the AI and machine learning developments. Where this, I, now I basically use this slides on my second slides of each presentation. If I talk about data quality is the data cascades and in the AI systems, which is one of the uh, paper put out by Google Research where they were looking at more than um, 100 AI application developers, figuring out what's the uh, most challenging part in their application development process. And so throughout the entire life cycle of the AI uh, system development process from the beginning of the problem statements de definition all the way to the de model deployment using the real or world data and in a more operational manners where they have identified the impacts of the data um, in the across the entire process of the uh, AI machine learning life cycle. And what they have identified is that data cascades can go through the entire life cycle, oftentimes compounding, uh, causing the uh, negative and downstream effects from the data issues that um, can result in those like, technical deaths over time that often can be leading to the uh, bad results or unreliable results of the system or can lead to the abandonment of the project just because when you're not, when you don't have enough high quality data, sometimes those systems won't be able to uh, perform or uh, be able to deploy. So that leads to some of the developments um, in the uh, AI machine learning community called data-centric AI. When we're viewing the AI application, that often is a combination between both code and data. And oftentimes uh, we have focused too, many, too much on the code in the past two decades, looking at how can we improve the model structure and improving uh, developing different type of model. But if you look at, for example, in the earth system science, one of the most classic examples is land use land cover change oftentimes um, the same model structure, if you're using a higher quality of the data, you can actually improve the performance of the outputs for the uh, land use land cover products by quite a lot. But uh, comparing to when you're trying to use different model structure, sometimes the performance can be uh, relatively lim limited. So within the data-centric AI, there are different streams of uh, work streams that are going on. One is specifically improving the quality or representation of the training data. Uh, in the development process. And the other part is inference of the data developments, uh, which is trying to improve the more representative uh, evaluation of the model in the deployments and evaluation stage. Where for the data maintenance, really how overall as a data system, can we improve the understanding, the assurance of the quality of the data, as well as the storage and retrieval of those data to make the system more efficient and more uh, reproducible. So I think this specifically calls out the data quality has been a one thing that community has been focused on in the past um, three, uh, four to five years. And so with the database cluster, we identify something called the AI-ready data with four different categories. I want to draw your attention specifically for the quality information in the data uh, AI-ready data characteristic that determines data's fit for purpose for the AI um, application process processes and can affect trustworthiness of the AI application uh, development process. But there's also other parts, including the documentation, also the quality of the documentation that kind of goes to different, um, different aspects of the information quality that has been presented early on and also the access part of it. So if you want to learn more about the uh, checklist, you can go to the Data readiness clusters at uh, GitHub uh, that's on the on the website uh, on the slides. So go a little bit more into the specifics about quality in the checklist or the data AI ready data characteristics. What we're looking at, including aspects of the completeness of data sets, consistency of data sets. I think that has been shown in George's presentation, where sometimes you will see a big inconsistency in the data because not because algorithm change or because something. It can be because of the how the data is collected, or it can be from different source of data, or slightly change. Uh, um, for example, if you're trying to combine different satellites, there might be inconsistency in it that can lead to downstream like impact, especially when you're trying to look at the trend uh, for the climate applications. 
and bias, unbiasedness or the bias in the data is a huge discussion right now. I'm sure gonna show some results later on and also timeliness and uncertainty information. I think uncertainty information has been also called out by George. And I think that is extremely important when you're trying to feed that into a machine learning application, when you have higher uncertainty in the input data itself, that how can we understand the uncertainty propagation from the input data all the way down to the uh, outputs of it. And so in one of the paper published by, uh, by colleagues in um, ASFAI Institute, AI2ES, they identify in different areas how AI systems uh, in the environmental science can go wrong, right? There are specific areas that are focusing on the training data. And there's also areas, re issues related to the model and issues related to the workforce and the society. And just, uh, this is a paper, it's a fun paper um, titled The Bugs in the Data and How ImageNet Misrepresents Biodiversity. So this paper, um, looking into the most famous uh, benchmarking data set in computer vision called ImageNet, they have, um, thousands of image data uh, collected and also with labels associated with it. And if you try to use that data set to develop a model AI system for biodiversity research, and you will find data like on the uh, top uh, left that you will find some animals dressed in a, a human human like clothing, and you can see some different type of animals like embedded into one image. When you and the label is often incorrect, and so when you try to use this data for uh, biodiversity applications, that can lead to problems. What they are looking at here on the right is also looking at the geographical representation of the image uh, available in the image net, and the black bar is true biodiversity across different parts of the world, and where on the um, on the colored bars are those info uh, representation of the biodiversity or the animal pictures. In the um, in the data set collection, you can see the well overall representation of the um, species in the United States and and also the Central and South America, but sometimes uh, and also Europe. So right, that can also lead to problems. And when you're looking at the quality or the accuracy of those labels from the data set, you will see different types of animals or biodiversity categories. Uh, there are a lot of mis uh, label the images in it. So if you solely rely on those data set to train a model that can lead to a lot of the problematic applications um, for the biodiversity study using this specific example. And so be a little bit more specific for geospatial or earth science application here that is looking at the, the geographical sampling of some data that may be used for AI system uh, developments. So this is an example looking at the geographical representation of the uh, radar network from the National Weather Service. Maybe, uh, so oftentimes those uh, undersampled bias may, it's not intentional, right? That is also defined because the the net, uh, the radar have to be set in certain regions where you can be uh, accessible by a road network sometimes that, the, and also by the terrain and other things that can limit where the radar can be set up. But when you're overlaying the uh, geographical regions of those networks for the um, for the population or demogra demographic data here, and the darker color means the higher percentage of the uh, African American population in those regions. So if you try to train or evaluate the model using this network, that can lead to some unanswered questions whether the model can perform as well in the regions where we don't have the data sampling in that case. So there are really, really quite a lot, lot of work focusing on how can we better understand the quality of the data sets before we use and or when we are using it for training a model and uh, understand how the, it performs and what can we uh, do to address those gaps or quality issues in the data itself to make sure the AI system is reliable and, um, and uh, trustworthy. So looking into the quality, uh, uh, quality aspects of a checklist, we look at specific things like the timeliness, especially when you try to do those like um, real time or near real time like applications or the completeness, how uh, and the geographical like representation of those and also the consistency and the bias, right? Bias that you can see there are a lot of questions about bias, how those bias are categorized and how those are documented. And um, we really want to uh, in, in the future be able to have those metadata information have a machine actionable bias and data quality information 
for the data set itself. So when the AI application uh, development um, technologists come to do that, they can easily find out the quality information before they really feed that into the model itself. So I'm going to end my presentation with this one of the uh, most recent discussion about different categories of bias and throughout the entire life cycle of the AI uh, system developments. It really started from the, it really starts from systematic and structural bias, both historical, social, and institutional, and how the historical data may be collected, uh, maybe unintentionally by certain um, social um, influences. And then there's the human bias and the oftentimes the attention information and also the um our person everyone has our own bias and when we choosing specific sets of the data to represent the system that is a um conscious decision we made uh, for those systems and so that's why people are, are really advocating for a diverse workforce when you are trying to uh, on the uh, data workforce as well as for the ai machine learning access and so for the specifically talking about data bias that how how we select the data how we clean the data and how we interpret the data and processing the data that can all lead to the bias and also just how we describing the data itself. And when we're talking about temperature, um, that can be everyone talking about temperature, that everyone can be talking about temperature in different ways. When we're talking about surface temperature, for on satellite perspective, oftentimes you are talking about skin temperature when you're talking about surface. But for the uh, observation or the uh, station network when you're measuring temperature, oftentimes that means a near surface temperature that's at two meter about height. So there is physical differences. So that there's all different layers of bias in terms of when we're talking about quality uh, of the data set itself. So there are a lot of efforts we need to put into uh, really to have defined the data quality and how those can be uh, represented in the metadata. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Douglas. I think uh, AI data quality is important to AI, and AI also important to data quality. Last week, I saw a, a, a presentation. You know, they use AI to do quality control. You know, yeah, uh, over almost half a million files. So find out those bad orbit. You know, data. You know, it's a very, very efficient. You know, it's impossible for human being eyeball through. You know, half a million files. You know, to to find the problem. Yeah. Okay, our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Ge Peng from University of uh, Alabama in Huntsville and also from uh, NASA Marshall Space Flight Center Impact Program. And uh, she will talk about uh, data quality and also fair implementation. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I think everybody is getting a little tired, but we're almost there. So today I'm going to talk about tools a unified uh, fair implementation profile for Earth uh, Science Data Product, and uh, um, as Joe mentioned, my name's uh, Go Pain. I go with Pain. I'm a co-chair of uh, uh, Information Quality Cluster, and I'm also um, together chair the um, NASA uh, Open Fair, um, Open Free and Fair Working Group. Um, The to uh, just have a very high level, uh, in case somebody ha has not heard the FAIR yet. So, FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And it's a set of high level um, guidance, guidelines to more, promote data sharing, um, especially in the um, computing friendly environment. It's formulated by a paper in 2016. And uh, the FAIR concept is, you know, they have very smart acronym. It's very simple, catchy, and it's positive. So it, it has been increasingly adopted um, by the policymakers and founders and organizations. So as a result of that, that there are storage requirements for organizations to demonstrate their fair compliance, level of fair compliance is what we call that fairness. 
um, I'm sorry if you were in um, the Wednesday session um, organized by the AI uh, readiness cluster. Um, I just want to kind of show this one. That there are detailed um, information presented in my presentation there. So the, the FAIR principle, the acronym is simple. It's very nice. However, implementing it is very different because they only present high level principles that doesn't tell you how and what you need to do. And they also intentionally to make it domain acoustic um, that you have to consider when you do implementation. So I'm not talk, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the uh, dependency on domain application and technologies. I just want to show this diagram indicate it's a multi dimension problem if you are trying to implement the um, FAIR principles. So the, the diagram is sort of like a knowledge graph from the FAIR all the way to the end of the definition. And FAIR by nature is multidimensional. It has four dimension, findable, uh, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And for each dimension, they are multiple sub principles. And for each principle, and there are categories. It touch on data metadata, of course, but it's actually also uh, involved infrastructures. And then you also have a core concept um, that it, at the end of the objective. So together with subject, uh, verb, and objective, um, you kind of have this first layer, uh, the uh, first layer in terms of what action from what category to what concept. But then from the individual concept, you also have this multifacetedness because the each element, it, the, the, the elements that uh, modify that ob uh, object, it, it's sometimes one, sometimes mod more than one. For example, for the, the F1, it's data assigned, the identifier, identifier needs to be globally unique and internal um, persistent. Yeah. So for machine in order for machine to readily integrate our um, product, so we need to speak the same language or the way to translate. So the, re the reason for that uh, point is that I have a table here, is the uh, reach uh, metadata. Um, so the even if we using same, you know, we adopting the same standards or similar standards, the implementation of that, how you uh, use the term that for that particular item, it's different. And here I have uh, NASA, um, NOAA, and USGS, and also did one which is. Um, repository for ecological data and also Arctic data. And this is the um, taking from the paper that um, we being submitted. It's under review and number of people in this room are part of that co-author. So I have a, a highlight temporal coverage there. So for NASA is temple extent, um, for NOAA is a temple element, and for USGS is temple information, and for uh, Data one is the beginning date and ending date. <laughs> Excuse me. They they are all sufficient to represent the information in their own way. However, machine doesn't know um, this is all same information they are trying to convey. And the, there are a number of um, the metrics and models um, over there. And uh, here listed one is from of, uh, Go Fair uh, Organization's Fair Implementation Profile. So it's a um, mini um, questionnaire. So you have um, on the, the left column, it's a, a fair principle IDs and the definitions. Then you have a question. That was not definite question associated with the definite, they actually break up into data and model data. 
And the, the next column is the enabling resource type. That's uh, very much similar to what I call about core concept. Um, then you have your answer. So that particular profile um, you can do for each individual um, organizations. Obviously, that profile will be different because for different organizations, the enabling, it will be different. Even if it's the concept is very similar, for example, for the searchable um, resources or um, category registered in um, the communication protocols, like NASA will be an Earth data search portal and for NOAA will be like one stop a portal. So the USDS has another uh, different kind for the um, data one, you have a data one portal. So the the idea is here, um, having this uh, profile is to see that enable the converging of the community because the big part of challenge for FAIR is the interoperability. And if even within Earth science the data community, and we don't talk to each other. And it's very hard to say, you know, our data is interoperable, right? Um, the one of the example for the the, the using the uh, this approach to uh, you know towards that um, uni unified way of representing something is the word fair. Um, they have this. Uh, uh, PIP community, so the each discipline put in their uh, profile, and the the fair wizard there is the uh, tool that's already um, available to community would actually take what you have, then the identifying the overlapping area and also point out the dispersed area. So the my question is that um, the in order for us to really to tours more fair, even within earth science data community, can we actually come together um, to collaborate towards a unified, uh, unified fair implementation profile just for earth product? If we, you know, it's very hard to say everybody doing the same thing because we have the system developed over many decades that works for our user community and works for our um, organization. But perhaps we can come to have a formal crosswalk. So they have a rep, um, repository now and you can have that crosswalk. So computer knows, you know, if it's NASA, this is what I use. If it's USTS, this is what I use. We um, they deposit that into that particular repository and the, the users would be able to use that and fit into their uh, machine and make it a lot easier to do that um, data in integration. So that's the question to everybody in this room and that will inform us in terms of the quality cluster. You know, if we want to do it, should quality cluster, uh, is quality information quality cluster a good venue to do that. If we do that, what will be the roadmap forward? And I'm looking forward to ideas from um, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, we're uh, doing on time, you know, so we still have uh, 20 minutes for questions for our speakers. Also, if you have comments, you know, feel free. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Sean. So, I, when I was giving my talk, I was trying to think of ways of improving the efficiency that is uh, reducing the effort on those humans. And uh, then I was uh, listening about how uh, AI uh, readiness is valuable and thinking it might be great if we could use AI to 
automate and semi-automate information quality review. That is uh, the data review for information quality. If we could do that, uh, then that might uh, further leverage the capabilities of machines and relieve those humans from uh, 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 such efforts. So uh, it might be something worth pursuing. Thanks. I think I would subscribe to semi automation where the automated uh, tool highlights areas that need further attention by humans. While I have a mic, I'd like to call on everybody in the room to look at the Google Doc and sign their names in. So any uh, questions or any comment for our speakers or, you know? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, yeah, the, as you can see, you know, so far, the landscape for uh, data quality is uh, very complex, but we do have the technologies. The problem is, uh, the question is, uh, you know, how can we you know, utilize uh, the technologies, you know, like uh, AI for data quality control, you know, yeah. And uh, that's something we can think about. Also the platform idea, you know, yeah, instead of depending on one agency to create a data system, you know, uh, for example, ESIP can uh, invest some uh, resources, you know, because it's a, uh, you know, multi-agency, you know, collaboration, then you can, we can build a, like a, like an idea, uh, data sharing platform, as well as maybe the computing uh, platform as well, you know, because uh, we need uh, the whole, you know, community uh, get involved, you know, to solve the massive uh, challenges. Yeah, that's a, I think that's an easy but can uh, play some uh, uh, role here, you know, yeah. Other than, you know, just one agency. So any thoughts? I guess another question is, uh, right, what work is being done in this area that, uh, we could start to leverage. Uh, that is, um, we certainly don't want to be reinventing the wheel if others have, have done something in this way, or if not quite, uh, if there's other work perhaps in AI that um, could then uh, be applied to our you know, uh, effort of information quality, and, and uh, we could leverage that if, if there's not direct work, or actually we could think about doing both. Yeah, and uh, I think George talked about a lot of, about, uh, you know, for the data producer point, uh, you know, for the, for how to deliver the uh, uh, data quality, yeah. I think for precipitation, in my opinion, you know, yeah, well, uh, based on the user need, you know, yeah. For example, you know, right now we focus on the extreme events and also climate change, you know, yeah. Maybe the uh, attention, maybe, maybe it's there, you know, yeah, so. Uh, how you gonna da your data set, you know, can uh, uh, answer the uncertainty for extreme events and also climate change, you know, yeah. And uh, we have a Mera expert in the room. <laughs> yeah, Mera is a Mera too is a very popular uh, data product, you know, yeah. So Zhu Hong, you want to comment about the data quality? For example, I in Giovanni, I don't see any, you know. Uncertainty parameters for Mera too. Yeah, I, I'm from GSS and supporting Mera too. It is a very popular product, and well, there's no data quality. <laughs> 
a parameter in, in the model data so far as I know. But um, people do um, their publications from both science team and also from uh, users. They have a publication and we have now collect, the TS desk has now uh, collect a lot of uh, publications from all uh, different resources and also uh, being, you know, categorize them into the field that including algorithm uh, validation part. So if someone wanted to know that information can look at that and also for applications, um, the most application area is air quality and then basically it, it being applied for all the area. Uh, there is a reason that people, <laughs> you know, a lot of more people are using that. So uh, there is some, might some bias, but it's usable for a lot of applications. That's why we use a lot. And another thing, uh, well, another thing I wanted to, to uh, kind of share the information, um, we mentioned the metadata. The metadata, um, there are several applications one is for data ingest. Without metadata, the data cannot be put into the system. And the other part is um, now more and more uh, services using it, trying to automate the service. So there is another part of metadata to, to kind of standardize the, um, well, different group using different metadata. The, the ingest group using global metadata, basically. And then the service, uh, the tools using like dimension or uh, the information within uh, the science field. So those are, can, if we can be uh, standardized as much as possible, then the system, the, the service can use it more. But so far, a different, uh, even within NASA, Probably if you're using different ingest system, using different <laughs> information in there. Um, so, and then we have recently uh, created something called the metadata modifier. We try to help uh, producers because producers usually focus on science data. They focus on quality of science data, and the, uh, the data science uh, data center curator working together with producer to, um, you know, manage the metadata, making sure the metadata quality is good. And then so we recently created a tool that um, can help adding the uh, metadata into the, the data files. And if, uh, you know, other group can at least interest that, maybe we can work it together, maybe we want to know that. Thank you so much. Yeah, any uh, further comments? Yeah, I, I remember I asked the same questions to uh, many people. So the first answer is uh, they're going to run some kind of multi-model ensemble, you know, to generate, you know, the uncertainty uh, information. Yeah, I think. And uh, the other question you mentioned, uh, you know, missing uh, metadata or incomplete metadata. I think we made a lot of uh, recommendations in terms of data quality, but uh, the, the question is, uh, it takes time, you know, to for PIs to implement those uh, recommendations. It's not that easy, you know, yeah. And uh, they are very busy, you know, they have other duties. So that for us, maybe we need to generate some kind of user-friendly tools to help them, you know, easily to add the information and to develop their data products, you know, to to, to you know, meet those uh, requirements. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, technology can really change a lot of things. Thank you. Um, I'm Fritz Gunther with No NCEI. One thing I've understood from this talk is that FAIR only really works if everyone is doing it the same way and that does not seem to be the case. Um, and so how do we work around that kind of gap in FAIR? Uh, yeah. 
Um, can I respond to that? No, I don't want you to um, go away with the notion that everybody has to do the same way. I think it's just that we need to convey the information in a machine, actionable machine can understand, can um, take the action from it. And in order for it to be integrate the data um, seamlessly. Thank you for that. Yeah, I guess it was the interoperable piece that stood out to me. If if one organization has data that feels interoperable to them, like the spatial extents, how, I guess I'm wondering what governing body is able to align the interoperability between massive data centers or archives. Um, yeah, ju uh, just to clarify. Yeah, so that's what I'm proposing is to have the collaboration that we can do a crosswalk. So for NCEI, if you are looking at the collection level metadata for this particular field, this is the, the name, the title or term is used. Um, so we don't have to change because that's impossible. And it will not make sense for NCEI to change their uh, metadata elements or collection level metadata. Okay, <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> Um, in terms of interoperability, I think that two, you know, two sides need to work together. Um, as a curator at a uh, data center, and if a uh, science team generally defined as NetCDA, we are, are required to be CF compliant. And since um, if we CF compliant, then a lot of the tools can work with it. And so basically the tool, if you don't have that ability, then you have to kind of also following the rules. Otherwise, <laughs> not, not data cannot always need the tools. So if you have two sides work together. And for example, um, the people in the GIS community, Usually, they, uh, um, for older version, it seems like they have difficulty working with uh, NetCDF files. Now, uh, they have been adding some features to work with it. And, but some people, uh, they don't uh, know it if they, the first time they work with first science data. But then uh, we have some kind of data culture, data recipe, we tell them, then they have. We see that uh, George put up a comment in the uh, in the uh, uh, on Zoom. I just wanted to bring up in the uh, data product uh, data producers development guide data product and data product development guide that we recently published. Uh, we were uh, as a working group. There was a working group under the uh, ESGSWG of the Earth Science Resistance Working Group. And that document has a lot of good recommendations for data producers to um, follow that will uh, go a long way in making the data sets more fair. Uh, we have called for a number of uh, metadata. We have listed a number of uh, metadata elements that need to be there and how each of those elements supports either F, A, I, or R, and the sub-principles within there. So that should help. And God just recently published it, so the links are available now. Um, Rachel, can you please repeat the link in the session note? Yeah. yeah, I think uh, as Sean mentioned, the incentives are very important. Yeah, I think back uh, to 20 years ago, you know, we, uh, for the tropical report management uh, mission, you know, we use the FDL board, you know, a lot of people outside comes out, you know, they don't know how to use that, that format, you know, yeah, not, not right now, you know, FDL 5 or NCDF 4 
it's very popular yeah so i think uh, yeah one reason is uh, you know tools are basically you know can make uh, uh, handle those uh, formats very easily you know other than you know as a matter of fact 20 years ago we, we also have a binary files you know yeah so, <laughs> and I finally ask you yes. Well, some people still like to ask you, you know, uh, outside the remote sensing community. Yeah, that's why Giovanni can uh, produce uh, uh, the data in ASCII format, you know, yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, one reason is uh, to have a platform, you know, data sharing uh, platform is uh, it can provide a lot of incentives, you know, yeah, because uh, when you're you know, you look for data, you 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 not only look for data from NASA, you look for data, you know, maybe, uh, you know, uh, on a global scale, you know, something like that, you know, yeah. A platform is a, it's a much easier because everybody has to follow certain, you know, format, you know, standards, you know, yeah, to make life easier. I think we're almost, we have three more minutes left. <laughs> yeah. So, any comments and thoughts? Otherwise, we, we can uh, end earlier. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to John and all the contributors here uh, for making a great session for the last session of the last day. Okay, thank you so much. And just as a quick reminder, the coffee and snacks are going to be back in the Expo Center, the big room, um, for this after this. Okay.